I've been sick, and I've been watching a lot of Netflix. Again. So back in April of 2017, for one week, there was one story that everyone on social media was talking about. Fire Festival was a music festival that was supposed to take place on a secluded island in the Bahamas. It was the brainchild of a young entrepreneur called Billy McFarland and was supposed to be the party of the century. It was publicized by some of the biggest Instagram celebrities on the planet, like Kendall Jenner and Bella Hadid, and its headlining artist lineup included big names like Major Lazer and Blink-182. What was supposed to be a once in a lifetime weekend getaway to the Bahamas fell victim to some spectacularly horrible planning and ended up being a disaster and a PR nightmare. People flew in thinking that they'd be staying in beach villas or luxury tents, but they pulled up to a site of rows and rows and rows of FEMA emergency shelters and where they were promised gourmet cuisine, they were given cheese sandwiches. It's been a little under two years since this whole fiasco happened, but in the past week and a half, both Netflix and Hulu have released their own respective documentaries uncovering the dumpster fire that was fire festival. I haven't watched the Hulu documentary yet, if only because the only event in which I'll renew my subscription to Hulu is when season 3 of Handmaid's Tale comes back on. Netflix's documentary is a pretty easy, digestible one and a half hour watch, but if you want to skip it, there is an 11 minute summary out on YouTube by internet historian that basically does the job. Okay, so for the record, I know for a fact that some of my students watch my channel, and I need to say that this documentary is rated TVMA and isn't meant for young audiences. Personally, I didn't think there was anything in the documentary that internet historian doesn't do a better job of covering, so I'd advise that you skip the documentary entirely and just watch that instead. Okay, moving on. So back in 2017 when this was happening, I remember the like super intense social media buzz that was happening behind this story and it was mostly covered with this kind of sense of schadenfreude where we were seeing all these like super rich kids who had spent $12,000 to go party on an island finally get their just desserts. But after seeing this documentary, the reality was that most of the people who had registered to go were actually paying between $500 to $750 to attend this event. This was all inclusive, flights, food, lodging, Watching music, whatever. I mean, $500 for an all-inclusive trip to the Bahamas seems like a pretty sweet deal, especially for this person who booked their last beach vacation through Costco.com. The Netflix documentary spent a pretty decent amount of time discussing Fire Festival's approach to marketing, which admittedly was genius. They paid a whole bunch of Instagram models to go down to the island and film a promo video for the event that was then spread all over social media by some of the top influencers on Instagram. The visual that this promo video was projecting was this like dreamlike experience where you would come in on a private jet or like stay in a yacht and party it up with all these models on a beach on this like beautiful island in the Bahamas and basically be part of like the upper crust, the elite for like one weekend. At one point in the documentary though, Billy McFarland actually says that the whole idea behind Fire Festival was to quote, sell a pipe dream to these average losers, which really pulls back the curtain behind what the whole intention of Fire Festival was to begin with. It'd be one weekend living the high life in luxury and exclusivity and feeling like you were one of the elite and being part of something really special. And after that, you just go home back to your sad, boring, humdrum, regular life. The whole idea of vacation kind of revolves around this, right? Like the idea that you're getting away from your regular boring life and you're escaping into something that is a little bit more special than usual, right? Like Disney World or Las Vegas or cruises. You work hard for 361 days out of the year just so you can spend four of them living like a rich man. But how does this idea translate to millennials now, the group that was supposed to be the target demographic for Fire Festival? Well, one major difference between millennials and past generations was that they see the idea, we see the idea of conspicuous wealth as something that's not necessarily to be desired in and of itself. We see things that like are trimmed in gold or like the Trump Towers of the world, not as being luxurious, but as being really tacky. The dream for millennials nowadays doesn't really seem to be owning diamonds or luxury cars or popping champagne all day. So it's almost as if the cautionary tales of chasing wealth and fortune don't seem to ring true to us because these material things aren't what millennials are after. So if not these material luxuries, what do millennials actually desire? What do they actually see as hashtag goals? Well, it seems like Fire Festival was able to capture the answer to this really well. So let me just read the on-screen text that came up on the Fire Festival promo video. Two transformative weekends and immersive music festival on a remote and private island in the Exumas. The best in food, art, music, and adventure. Once owned by Pablo Escobar. On the boundaries of the impossible, fire is an experience and a 
festival, a quest to push beyond those boundaries. Okay. So the idea is that by going to Fire Festival, you're chasing after something really special or life-changing or transformative. It's a quest, it's an adventure. It feels spiritual almost, which is all really silly if you think about it because even if Fire Festival delivered on all of its promises, it's just a music festival in the Bahamas. It's not the second coming of Christ. I mean, after all, Woodstock was one of the greatest cultural phenomena of our time, and I don't doubt that some really special, transformative, life-changing things happened there. I mean, I'm not in the business of judging people on how they choose to seek meaning and purpose in their life, and if going to music festivals is your thing, hey, by all means. But I think we're living in really interesting times where the question of how to sell stuff to millennials seems to be the question of the hour. And to answer the question, I mean, first, to state the obvious, millennials, on the whole, have no money, so... <laughs> But even if we did, I don't think most of us would admit to spending it on luxury, even if that's what we actually wanted out of life. It's just not cool to be shallow anymore or to indulge in unearned luxury. And when we see people who do live that kind of lifestyle, we expect that they'll have worked really hard or hustled for it. And we respect the hustle more than the material possessions that they now enjoy. So when you've got something like Fire Festival, which is at its core, this luxury music festival in the Bahamas, you can't brand it as this like beach vacation for rich kids because that comes across as basic and elitist and just not attractive to your average millennial. But brand it as this life-changing experience and people's tunes start to change because it's no longer a luxury beach vacation on mommy and daddy's dime. It's something with purpose and meaning. Even beyond all of this, people in their heart of hearts still want to have that luxury experience or at least for things to be nice but it's got to be special it's got to be unforgettable once in a lifetime this experience that has some sort of meaning and purpose to it pricing early bird tickets at $500 wasn't just a clever marketing strategy or a way to build initial hype around the event it was a way to bring in a demographic of people who otherwise would have no means of affording this luxury experience but now that they're given the reasoning that this is a once in a lifetime event that will change their lives they now have the justification to spend this money on an event as luxurious as this. Using Instagram influencers to promote the event was genius because it captures exactly why Instagram celebrities are such effective advertisers today. They don't seem like celebrities in the traditional sense because they're accessible, they're relatable, they're right on our phones. We could party with them if we wanted to, they're just like us. When a beauty guru on YouTube recommends a highlighter or a brow pencil, it almost feels as if they're our friends telling us that this product is really, really awesome and we should try it, even if in reality, they're being paid to tell us that we should buy this product. The draw of these Instagram celebrities is that they make us feel as if we can trust them. And that trust comes from a place of accessibility that makes us feel like going to a beach party with Bella Hadid isn't nearly as far-fetched as like say going to a rooftop bar with Johnny Depp. I mean, to be honest, most traditional celebrities are starting to follow this route more and more. Just take a look at Ariana Grande's Instagram. What's ironic though, is that all these Instagram celebrities or like real life celebrities are still super rich. Kendall Jenner was paid $250,000 for one Instagram post advertising Fire Festival. Even Billy McFarlane was private jetting himself back and forth from the Bahamas and like living on a yacht for most of the documentary. The founder of Fire Festival was actually wealthy enough to live every day the lifestyle that he scammed thousands of young people into believing they could experience for just one weekend. It doesn't matter how how much we believe that experiences like Fire Festival are life-changing or transformative or special, to these people, we're still just your average losers. I mean, I guess if there's one redeeming factor to all of this, it's the fact that Billy McFarland is now currently sitting in prison for the next six years for defrauding like a whole bunch of people. But I think the events surrounding Fire Festival prompt a really good discussion on what millennials really want. Do we want luxury or even the appearance thereof? Well. No, because most of us can't afford it, so having it makes us look really tacky and basic. And if there's one defining characteristic of our generation, it's probably our immense fear of negative perception by others. But because we're human, the visceral desire for luxury and wealth still exists. We just want it to mean something. A great example of this is Ariana Grande's music video for Seven Rings, which is the most incredible anthem to materialism probably ever. But after the music video was released, Ariana Grande took 
to Instagram and posted this thing explaining how Seven Rings was actually a feminist anthem on how she can unapologetically own and flaunt all of her material wealth because she earned it and it's hers and just because she's a woman she doesn't have to minimize herself and her accomplishments, which I guess is something I could get behind. But let's be real, the main draw of the song in the video is the exact same as every other I Got Money anthem that's ever existed. We like it because it's escapist fantasy, which is what this is all about, isn't it? I mean, whether it's a life-changing experience in the Bahamas or a solid gold toilet, we seek out these things because somehow our regular lives aren't good enough and they're something we need to escape from. The question now is, are our lives really objectively that terrible because of capitalism or social inequality or racism or whatever? Or is this just your typical human habit of thinking that whatever we have right now is just not enough? Honestly, I see merits to both arguments. Anyway, this video probably came across as being much more preachy than I had originally intended, and it was mostly made out of a reaction to seeing people place all of the blame for Fire Festival on like social media or Instagram or like these influencers or celebrities, most of which are women, by the way. And I understand the instinct to want to place blame on someone or something whenever disaster arises, but I think if there's blame to be had, it probably should be placed on the person who's currently serving six years in federal prison for fraud, as well as the people who enabled him. At the same time, though, I think there's a lot of value in being being honest about what exactly it is we want out of life without necessarily being reductive. The fact is, if you were to isolate what exactly it is millennials want out of life, it's meaning. And through Fire Festival, we can kind of see how easily exploitable that desire is, which is kind of evil if you think about it. Anyway, I'm going to go back to seeking meaning in my life by lying in bed and drinking lots of honey lemon tea and trying to get unsick. I hope this was interesting for all of you to watch and listen to. Uh, many thanks to the bunch of internet strangers who found my last half hour video on learning Chinese. I'm blown away and I'm encouraged that so many of you thought that that was meaningful. Um, and for those of you who came back for more, thanks a lot. Until next time.